On the night of January 25th, 1980, the temperature on Nantucket Island, Massachusetts dropped below freezing. It was so frigid that it was almost unbearable to so much as step outside without a thick, heavy-duty coat and ski mask on. The wind whipping in from the Atlantic dropped the temperature even further and the waves crashed against the shore with all the fury of Mother Nature herself. It's a night that old islanders remember well, because it was the night that Margaret Kilcoyne disappeared without a trace. An assistant professor of medicine from Columbia College in New York, she flew to the island a few days prior and was last seen dining with her brother and two friends, before retiring to her home in Tom Nevers for the night. The next morning, her brother had reported her missing. There were no footprints showing her leaving at all, no trail to mark her having gone anywhere. There was a huge search and rescue mission launched for her. Coast Guard choppers flew overhead, and teams of local and state police, along with island firefighters, combed the beaches, swamps, and woods for her. But she was never found, and the authorities told the press that nobody knew what had happened to her. And why am I telling you all of this? Because it was a lie. They know well what happened to her, and she wasn't the only one to disappear either. And it's time that the truth was told. I was a young man back then, only just having turned 28. Having graduated from the police academy and served in the Boston Police Department for four years, I grew tired of the hustle and bustle of city life, as well as admittedly disillusioned by the senseless violence that I saw others inflict upon each other for drugs, money, or just for kicks. So I applied to the Nantucket Sheriff's Department in February of 1978. I was accepted and I quickly moved to the island, which lay 30 miles off the shore of Cape Cod. For almost two years it was quiet. Lifelong residents welcomed me, though always kept me slightly out of reach due to being an outsider. It was something that I honestly didn't mind in exchange for peace and quiet. Island life was slow and predictable, and aside from calls about public drunkenness and dumb teenagers, there were no serious incidents. That was until the night of January 15th, 1980. I had just gotten on duty and sat down at my desk to take over on the night shift when the sheriff came striding out of his office behind me, a slightly worried look on his face. Vincent, come with me, he said simply, and then turned to the other deputy locking up his desk for the night. Johnson, you're going to have to do some overtime work tonight. Stay here until we get back. I heard Johnson let out a weak cry of protest, but I was already moving for the door, grabbing my coat and following the sheriff out of it. The night was as cold as a witch's tit, and a light rain had begun falling. You drive, he told me, tossing me the keys to a Dodge Ram Charger that served as one of the two sheriff's department cruisers. Slipping behind the wheel, I started the truck and pulled out onto the road. Where are we going? I asked the silent shape in the passenger seat after a moment. We're going to Sconset. The chief of police asked for our assistance over there. He said, reaching down and hitting the switch for the lights, which bathed the world around us in a swirling glow of red and blue. Sconset was a small village at the easternmost point of the island. I frowned. In all my time here, the local police have always been able to handle the cases that came their way on their own. What's so bad that the chief had called us in? A small pit had begun to settle itself in my stomach, and it grew heavier as my unasked question was answered. And Brian Mays is missing. I tore my eyes from the flicking windshield wipers in dark road in front of me to shoot the sheriff a look. Catching my gaze, he slowly nodded. His usually light eyes now looked sharp and alert. Not saying another word, he turned back to stare out into the night. I did the same as my thoughts began to race anew. Brian was a fisherman, somebody who I had always been friendly with when we ended up being called down to the docks. A hulking but quiet man in his mid-forties, he lived with his wife in a one-bedroom cabin near the water's edge. As far as I knew, he had no disagreements with any other locals, or drank enough to wander off in an inebriated stupor. 
The fact that the sheriff had deliberately used the word missing troubled me, though I didn't know why. 20 minutes later, we turned onto the sandy road that served as the maze driveway. Two police cars already sat out in front of the house. I could see Mrs. Mays talking with the chief of police. She looked almost inconsolable. Parking the truck and getting out, he broke away, leaving her in the care of one of his officers while he strode over to us. Lewis, it's good to see you, he said, reaching out and shaking the sheriff's hand before sighing. Though I wish it were under better circumstances. The sheriff nodded. Yeah, the feeling's mutual, he replied. The chief turned and looked at me, nodding. Uh, Deputy Cotes, good to see you again, son. I nodded back. Sir, the sheriff cleared his throat, signaling pleasantries that ended. What have you got? The chief turned and gestured towards the house. We got a call about 45 minutes ago. Annette said that she had woken up around 11.30 due to a severe chill in the house and discovered that Brian was not in bed with her. She got up to try and find him and discovered the back door out to the beach standing wide open. She tried searching and calling for him for 15 minutes before calling us. He turned to me. I understand you used to work in the city and you were pretty good at helping detectives track down missing people. Deputy, is that correct? I nodded, feeling my professional mind kick into gear, something that I hadn't had to use since moving here. Yes, sir, I was. I answered simply. He nodded, seeming somewhat relieved, and then gestured toward the open front door of the house. Please, and go join my officers inside. See if there is anything that we might have missed, because we can't spot a trace of where he could have gone. I'm going to speak to the sheriff for a few more minutes. I nodded again and then turned away and strode towards the house. And behind me I could hear the two men begin talking fast in hushed tones. But I was already slipping into the old skin that I had to wear back in Boston, detached and clinical. Stepping inside, I shivered slightly. The frigid air had invaded every inch of the house's interior. The warmth that it once held long since stripped away. The lights were on, meaning that I didn't have to pull my flashlight from my service belt. Three local officers stood in the tiny living room, conversing quietly with one another. They turned to look at me as I entered. You must be Deputy Cotes. The first, a tall, clean-cut man whose name tag stated his name was Holiday, spoke. Uh, that'd be me, I answered, offering my hand to him, which after an odd delay, he took in a quick shake. I began looking around, taking in every detail of the room. My eyes were immediately drawn to the back door, which still stood wide open. I could see the pale white sand caught in the glow from the doorway. Darkness lay beyond, but I could hear the pounding of the waves as they slammed violently into the beach. So, where have you looked? I asked them. Holiday shrugged. Uh, we've looked everywhere, deputy. There are no footsteps leading from the back door outside, and the only ones in front were from them coming home. Nothing's been stolen from inside to our knowledge. Not that there's much of value in here, if I'm honest. He shook his head, pursing his lips and furrowing his brow. That's not the strangest part, though, he added. I cocked my head. What is? I asked, still glancing around. My eyes slid over the small, cheap knickknacks lining the shelves, the ancient television set against the far wall, and the torn couch and chair set behind us. Like they had said, nothing looked disturbed. Holiday finally answered. Maze didn't take any of his clothes. I started, turning to look at the man. I beg your pardon, I said, another head shake. Maze didn't take any of his clothes. His coat is still hanging up on its hook, along with his hat, scarf, and gloves. His boots are still sat by the shoehorn. Heck, he didn't even appear to get dressed. His shirt and pants are still crumpled by the bed. He shot a look out the back door. If he's out there, he's in nothing more than long johns and that's it. My mind churned as it processed what I had been told. I'm shivering while fully dressed in here. The man wouldn't be able to make it far without succumbing to the elements. 
but why would he leave like this, undressed and so abruptly? My gaze fell upon the kitchen where I spied the fridge standing slightly open, yellow light spilling out from within. I crossed to it, the officers trailing behind. On the countertop next to the fridge, the ingredients to make a sandwich had been placed. An open jar of mayonnaise and a butter knife stood beside two slices of bread and ham which had been set down. My mind put dots together, creating a mental picture in it. Well, it looks like he came out from the bedroom to make himself a late night snack. I said, reaching out and gently closing the fridge door. I looked back at the living room and then walked towards it. He was making the snack when something drew his attention to the back door. I turned and looked at the shaft of light spilling outside in the void beyond. I could see the half-awake man in my mind's eye, slowly approaching the closed door. He got to the back door and opened it and then... I trailed off, staring at the sand directly on the other side of the door. No footprints were visible in it, just as the officers had said. One of the other officers spoke up, a short, stocky guy with a military-style crew cut. And then what? I continued to stare at the sand. Something about it looked off, something that I couldn't place. Finally, I shook my head. I honestly don't know, officer, I answered. It's like he just winked out of existence the moment that he opened the door. The man spoke again, his voice holding a small note of contempt in it. So that's your professional opinion. He winked out of existence like some sci-fi pulp novel. Holiday spoke up. Sean, easy, the deputy's doing his best at assessing the scene. The other officer, Sean, snorted but said nothing more. I took a step outside, making sure to step well over the area where any trace evidence might be. Pulling my flashlight from my belt, I clicked it on and shone it down and then around. The sand appeared to be undisturbed for at least 20 feet from the cabin. I clicked my light off, allowing my eyes to adjust to the darkness. At the edge of my vision, I saw the surf crashing against the shore. The black rolling waves seeming almost ominous with the present situation that I found myself in. As I stood there looking out at the ocean, a feeling suddenly fell over me. One that I hadn't felt since moving to the island. One that I had often had while working the beat in the city. It wasn't a welcome feeling either. It was the sensation of being watched. And by someone who had the worst intentions. I slowly stood up, my instincts flooding back to me as though I had never turned them off. I could feel the eyes boring into the back of my skull, as intense as I had ever sensed in my life. A shiver cascaded up my spine and I slowly began moving my free hand towards the revolver on my belt. I kept my breathing slow and steady, but the feeling was growing stronger, as if whoever was doing the staring was getting closer. Mental images of times that I had had addicts or criminals attempt to ambush me tore through my mind. And yet, the sensation felt different. It was a more primal response, if that would properly describe it. It was as though my body felt in more danger than it ever had back in Boston. Trying not to draw attention to it, I silently unsnapped the loop holding the gun in place. Behind me, I heard a single sound. The snap of a branch or piece of brush cracking underfoot, and it was less than 15 feet behind me. A new feeling fell over me, one that I didn't like. Fear. I didn't know why, but the sound coupled with the sudden silence that followed sent a waterfall of it through me. I didn't dare hesitate any longer. I ripped the revolver from its holster, whirling around and snapping the light on. At the same instant, I swear, no, I know that I saw a flurry of movement from the undergrowth behind me. I aimed both the light and the gun at the space, but when the beam reached it, it had already gone. I took a quick breath and then yelled out, my voice deep and authoritative. Nantucket Sheriff's Department, come out of there with your hands up. I heard an explosion of movement coming from behind me. Heard the officers, both inside the house and in front of it, begin calling out but I stayed trained on the area, beginning to move around the side of the brush for a better view. Whoever it had been and every part of me said that it hadn't been a simple animal, 
couldn't have gone very far. I heard someone call out my name. Deputy Codas, what is it? I heard Halliday's voice boom out. Somebody's back over here. They booked it as soon as they realized that their hiding spot was compromised. I called back, not taking my eyes off the space. There was no movement now, but I wasn't taking any chances. Moments later, almost all the officers along with the sheriff had joined me, their weapons drawn and pointing at the line of brush. After a few tense moments of ordering whoever it was to come out, myself and a few of the officers moved in to clear it. We found nothing. Nobody was in the brush. Whoever it had been was long gone. I was almost afraid that I would be labeled jumpy or just hearing things until Sean the officer who I had not gotten along with called that he had found a lot of trampled and cracked brush, almost exactly 15 feet from where I had been standing. It confirmed my story. This put a much darker atmosphere over everything. We might no longer be dealing with a simple disappearance, but a much more nefarious case. Once we were sure that nobody was around, we gathered out in front of the house. Once the sheriff had guided Mrs. Mays inside, assuring her that an officer would be parked outside all night for safety, the chief addressed all of us. Gentlemen, what I'm about to request of you all is of the utmost importance. This is an ongoing investigation and as such, it needs to be kept out of the media. We don't need the newspapers and especially these stations on the mainland to get a hold of this. Not only could it mess our investigation up, but it would send the populace into a panic and we can't afford that. So please just keep this to yourselves until such time I state otherwise. Is that understood? And everyone else nodded almost immediately. I felt another knot begin to tie itself in my stomach. I didn't agree with the chief's call. Whenever we had a bad case in the city, alerting the media helped to keep the public aware and safe. I felt as though the chief were more thinking in terms of containing the damage than finding Mr. Mays, or the person who had been skulking around watching us. Even still though, I nodded. All these decades later, I wish that I had had the sense to alert the media and not let it get buried under the rug. As we drove back to the sheriff's station, I voiced my concern to the sheriff, who now sat in the passenger seat, writing out a report on his clipboard. He nodded when I finished. I understand your concerns, Vincent, he began, but the chief has good reasons for choosing to keep a lid on such a sensitive issue, and they're the ones that I happen to agree with. I began to speak again, but he raised a hand to silence me. There's nothing more to be discussed on the subject, deputy. You are to stay quiet about this case, understood? The tone of his voice indicated that it was an order and not a request. I simply nodded and then turned back to the empty road ahead. When the man spoke again, his tone was softer. Hopefully we'll find Brian May soon, along with whoever was watching you. I can't see this going beyond a single case. Just relax, son. I nodded again, still feeling as wound up as a rattlesnake inside, but trying to let the man's words be of some comfort. Still though, I remembered the feeling that I had had out back at the house. The almost primal fear. The thought that I couldn't push away that. If I hadn't been aware and turned around when I did, I would have been attacked, maybe dragged off without a trace like Brian Mays had. I pushed the thought away. I hoped that the sheriff was right. I had hoped this would be the only case that I would have to deal with of this nature. It somehow unnerved me, almost scared me more than anything that I had dealt with in Boston. I actually prayed that night that this would be the end of things. And when I fell asleep to dark and disturbing dreams of the poor man being dragged away by a shadowy figure to an unknown fate, I almost felt that he would be right. Oh, he was wrong. So very wrong. Two nights later, halfway through the graveyard shift, we received another call from the chief. Another person had been reported missing, this time from a home near the South Shore. A 23-year-old woman named Jenny, who had worked as a cashier at one of the grocers downtown. Her boyfriend had, just like a nut maze, woken up to find it freezing, and gone downstairs to find the back door opening onto the beach 
swinging in the wind to point off of the Atlantic. When we arrived, it was almost a carbon copy of the maze case. She hadn't taken any clothes and it seemed that she had woken up to use the bathroom when she had gone down to investigate something at the back door. There was one difference though that caught my eye. A Russian nesting doll which had sat on a shelf next to the open door had been toppled from its perch, spilling at these smaller dolls onto the carpet. The sight of the spilled and chipped toy caused a new wave of trepidation and yes, fear to sweep inside me. It's not much, but it's a sign of a struggle of some kind. Again, the chief told everyone, including Jenny's boyfriend, to keep quiet until he said otherwise. And again, everybody agreed. Everyone but me. I couldn't understand why everybody was so ardent about not alerting the general public to what now was no longer an isolated incident, but the beginning of a pattern. And when two more people disappeared from their homes in almost identical fashion in the span of a week, one, an elderly man in his 80s and a teenager of no more than 15, the feeling grew stronger. I was toiling over the idea of anonymously alerting the mainland news, or even just the local paper, when the next call came in. It was another disappearance, but this one was not an islander, which surprised me. Not many people from the mainland came to the island during the winter months, but apparently this woman had. A scientist named Kilcoin. She had flown to the island a few nights prior, and after falling asleep after a night out with local friends, her brother, some bigwig for IBM computers I learned later who would come with her, had woken up to a scene that I had become far too familiar with. When we arrived at the fancy house in Tom Nevers, I saw instantly that the chief was angry. He looked calm for all outer appearances, but I saw him gritting his teeth tight as he spoke to the brother, and then he strode over to us. Another one, chief? The sheriff asked. He nodded. And of all people, it had to be the sister of a rich and well-connected city slicker. I started at the man's harsh tone. He's not going to be somebody that we can keep quiet like the others. He continued shaking his head. The Coast Guard is going to be called and somehow the media already had gotten a hold of the story. He shot me a suspicious look, as though he suspected that I had somehow been able to call the paper a mainland in the half hour since we had taken off. I shrugged, but inside, I felt a small sense of victory. I wish I had been the one who called, but maybe now word will get out. It needs to. We did our walk through, again just like before the back door to the house stood wide open. None of her clothes had been put on and no trace of her footstep were found outside in the sand. However, there was one difference in this case, something that I had noticed as I had looked at the back door. There, set in the door frame just below eye level, were what appeared to be two or three deep gouges. They weren't that big and against the other nicks and grooves in the wood. It might have not been noticed, but I knew they were fresh. I ran my fingers over the grooves, surprised at how deep they truly were. It was as if two or three sharp kitchen knives had been slammed into and dragged through the wood. For whatever reason, a shiver shot up my spine, one that was equal parts fearful and wary. I quickly brought the sheriff over who regarded the marks with an odd look. It was almost as if he had seen them before and he simply asked me to mention it to my report. As he turned away, I glanced down at the sand just outside the door. I was dismayed to see that like May's case, like all the others, one thing that I had always noticed was that the sand by the door just seemed unnatural in the way that it sat, not looking blown about by the wind like the rest of it. I stepped out of the door and looked around. The wind bit at my face and I turned away from it, looking out at the crashing waves. For some reason, the sight of the dark churning water along with the ominous looking dark clouds above caused me to shiver. A feeling suddenly swept over me, the same that I had had that night we had gone to the maze house, the same feeling that I had had when we had gone to investigate all of the disappearances. A being watched observed like I was a fish in a fishbowl. I swung around, my head darting in all directions, but I saw no one on the empty beach or the nearby sand dunes. 
but still the feeling remained and the same unexplainable sense of fear returned. Not wanting to stay out here alone any longer, I turned to head back inside, but I stopped. The nagging thought that I had been unable to vocalize about the sand finally clicked and I looked down at it. It almost looked like it had been swept, I whispered. A few hours later, the state troopers from the mainland had arrived and the sheriff told me to take the cruiser and head back to the station. Johnson will be there to drive it back here and take over for the day. Your shift is ended for the night. He began to turn away when I cleared my throat. Sir, with all due respect, don't you think that we should tell the state police along with the media that this woman isn't the one who's... He cut me off sharply. No, nobody will be telling either of them anything. That's an order and if you attempt to disobey it, I will detain and arrest you. Is that clear? My jaw dropped open as I stared at him. His words had been the last that I had expected. The man shot daggers at me and then jerked his arm at the open front door, where I saw a large congregation of officers speaking to the chief, along with a reporter from the island news. Now go and have a good day. And with that, I turned away. To this day, I still can't properly explain the emotions that ran through me as I walked outside and got into the cruiser. The closest I can describe was that I felt bound and gagged, a prisoner without shackles. As I drove back to the station, I began to give some serious thought about transferring off the island and leaving. Nothing about this entire situation smelled right. When I had come to Nantucket, I originally wanted to spend the rest of my life here. It seemed so different, so peaceful. But now, after the last week or so, it felt tainted. If anything, it felt worse than the city. The city had dope peddlers, murderers, and fiends, but you knew about them. This place felt like secrets that shouldn't be concealed. And worse, after the look that I had seen on the sheriff's face, it almost felt like he knew something, if not had an idea of who was taking these people. I had no idea that I would be faced with one final disappearance a few days later. One that would draw me into the most terrifying and horrific experience of my life. I wasn't even on duty when it happened. I had been transferred to the day shift by the sheriff who I was still on thin ice with. My shift ended at just after 10 at night and I climbed into my jeep for the drive back to my house near Sacaja Pond. I pulled out a cassette tape from the tray under the dash and slid it in. The opening guitar riffs of the Rolling Stones give me shelter echoing out from the speakers. As I drove, my mind became more and more firm in its decision to quit the department and leave the island. I turned onto a road that paralleled the ocean on the right, houses lining up and blocking the view of the beach. I just can't do this anymore. I can't be a part of some cover-up for whatever dumb reason the chief has. This is just too. I glanced up to see something run out into the road in front of me. No, not something, someone. Crap, I yelled out, jamming my feet on the brake and clutch pedals. The back wheels of the jeep locked up and for a moment, the world whirled around and my ears filled with the noise of screeching tires. And then the jeep came to a stop with a lurch, looking back the way that I had come. I sat there trying to catch my breath for a few seconds when the face appeared, almost pressing up against the windshield. Gah, I yelled out my hand flying to my personal pistol lying under the dash. But I stopped as I saw the panicked expression of the young woman's face, a girl no older than 16. Please help me, sir, she wailed out. Unlocking the door, I made sure the jeep's parking brake was on before jumping outside. Immediately, the girl ran around the door and buried her face in my stomach. She was crying uncontrollably, and I could tell that she was almost out of her mind with fear. Still, I needed to know what was going on. Sweetie, it's okay, I'm an off-duty deputy. Try and calm down and tell me what happened. Instantly, the girl's face looked up at me, and I couldn't help but shiver slightly, both at the petrified expression adorning her features, along with the words that she babbled out. I woke up to use the bathroom, and I heard my daddy downstairs doing something. He always stays up late. But then I heard him curse and something crashed. 
I heard breaking glass and wood and then I heard something scream and hiss. Something horrible. She wiped her eyes with the sleeve of her nightgown. I heard my daddy scream in pain and ran downstairs. Now she began to scream as she finished. It had him and it was dragging him out the back door. He was bleeding. Please help me. Another shiver shot through me but I pushed it down. You have to stay in control of yourself, Vincent. Your first duty is to keep the girl safe and call for backup. Then you need to see if the father is still near the house. The girl is delirious and thinks a masked man was something else. You need to move fast. Nodding at my own thoughts, I guided the girl into the passenger seat and then locked the door. Returning to the driver's side, I grabbed my pistol along with the spare flashlight before reaching for the CB radio that I had wired under the dash. Tuning into the frequency the sheriff's department used, I hit the transmit button. Any deputy monitoring this frequency, this is Deputy Codes, requesting urgent backup. Does anybody copy? The voice that answered was Johnson's. Codes, this is Johnson. What's going on? Over. Johnson, notify the sheriff and tell him to get as many local police out to my location as well. I just came across a panicked girl who said somebody broke in and took her father. I let the words hang in the air for a moment, letting them sink in. Ah, oh Christ, not another one. I heard Johnson breathe. I hit the transmit button again. I'm leaving the girl in my jeep and going to check out the house to see if the father is still alive. Get back up here ASAP. I heard him respond, but I had already turned to the girl. Sweetie, I need to leave you in the truck while I go to see if your father's okay. She began to frantically shake her head, but I put a reassuring hand on her shoulder. It's alright, more police are on the way. Just stay in the truck and keep the door locked, okay? I'll be right back. And with that, I locked the driver's door and shut it with a clunk. I turned towards the darkened shape of the house the girl had to have run into the road from. Even from here, I could see the front door hanging wide open, occasionally swinging when a gust of wind came. A single light burned out from what had to have been the living room. Other than that, though, everything was quiet. There were no bird calls, no animals in the brush. The only things that I could hear were the pounding of the surf from the other side of the house, and the creek as a swing bench mounted to the front porch swiveled in the breeze. Otherwise, a silence. To this day, I can still recall the amount of adrenaline and fear that coursed through my veins as I prepared for what might be a violent confrontation. Swallowing harder than I usually did, I shot one last look at the jeep and then began to walk towards it. As soon as I had reached the path to the front porch, I slowed down, the hand gripping my pistol now slightly sweaty even with the chill. I took a moment to breathe deep and then began to slowly creep towards the house making sure my footsteps made as little noise as possible. There was still no movement from the house, but the atmosphere that I was picking up set me even more on edge than I thought possible. The air seemed charged and tense, as if the world around me were collectively holding its breath. And there was another feeling that I was picking up on, something that I couldn't place yet, and it was the same that I had had at all the other disappearance sites except this one was 10 times stronger. Reaching the porch, I tested the bottom step to make sure that it wouldn't creak and then ascended to open the front door. The entryway was dark, but even in the gloom, I could see a staircase leading to the second floor just inside. A hallway led around it towards the back of the house and I could also see a doorway leading off to another room to the right. There's likely an identical doorway to the left if the layout of this place is similar to my house. I waited a moment, forcing everything except my training out of the forefront of my mind, and then I stepped halfway through the door. I had been correct in my assumption, a doorway to what seemed to be a sitting room lay on my left. I tilted my head so that I could see down the hallway. Nothing moved in the stillness, and I could hear the ticking of a clock echoing from the end of it. I took another deep breath, and then as much as I didn't want to, I forced myself to follow procedure and call out. Nantucket Sheriff's Department, if anybody's in there, please make yourself known. My voice sounded almost muted as it filled the house. Well, there goes the element of surprise. I flicked my flashlight on, tucking the wrist holding it under my gun hand, the yellow beam trailing up the stairs toward the second floor. I eyed the half-open windows at the top of the landing apprehensively. 
Normally, the standard procedure for a single officer clearing a home is to do the ground floor first and then move upstairs. But ever since I had gone to a domestic disturbance call five years ago, one where a man coked out of his mind had burst out of the upstairs bedroom with a shotgun while I had been clearing the first floor, I had ingrained it in me to clear the second floor first. Moving to the stairs, I climbed them quickly, thankful that, aside from a small creak on the second step, they didn't make any noise. The first door led to what had to be the father's bedroom, the large bed empty. The second opened onto a small upstairs bathroom. The third led into what had to be the girl's bedroom. As I saw a half-open closet on the other side, I chose to enter the room crossing and making sure that nobody was hiding inside. Confident that nobody was upstairs, I turned and began to head back out to the hallway, but I froze as I spared a glance out of the window. The window of the girl's bedroom faced the back of the house towards the beach. It was dark, but the clouds had pulled back some, allowing the moon to shine down onto the sand and spill into the room. It provided enough light to look down to the ground, where I caught a glimpse of a darkened figure moving. It was only for a split second whoever it had been had stepped out of line of sight visible from the room, but it was enough. I quickly clicked off my light, feeling my heart begin to beat harder in my chest. I trusted my instincts and all of them were telling me that whoever the figure had been, that it wasn't the girl's father. Moving out into the hallway, I trained the gun back downstairs. Nothing moved inside, but to say the air inside the house had taken on an even worse atmosphere would be understating it. Every darkened corner now felt threatening. Every gust of the wind hitting the windows made me feel that much tenser. Descending the stairs, I first cleared the sitting room, finding it empty, and then I made my way down the hallway towards the back of the house. I found myself in a long but narrow kitchen, the tile floor reflecting in the moonlight. This too looked to be clear. I saw a door which appeared to lead outside to the beach but turned away. I needed to finish clearing the house and after seeing the figures skulking around outside, I wasn't prepared to venture out there alone. I couldn't hear the sirens signaling my backup yet, but I knew that they had to already be on their way. Just clear the final rooms on the ground floor, then pull back out to the jeep until the others arrive. Don't be a hero and don't be stupid. Not after seeing this guy's prior handiwork. My decision made, I slowly walked back towards the entryway. The soft sound of the clock behind me chiming caused me to freeze for a moment, and then I reached the other doorway. The light that I had seen in the front window appeared to come from this room. What I could now see appeared to be a study of some kind. Books lined the shelves on every wall and an ornate desk and chair sat in the middle of the room, papers piled on top. As my eyes flickered beyond the desk, where anybody could easily hide, a noise came from beyond, causing me to raise my weapon again. I saw a doorway that I hadn't noticed at first on the far side of the room, the door wide open. I crossed the study slowly, making sure nobody was crouched behind the desk before approaching the door. The room beyond was dark, but I could see a large table surrounded by chairs set up in the middle of it. A dining room. Moving silently now, I scanned the room. I saw no sign of movement inside, but something had begun welling up inside me as I approached the door. Every fiber of my being had been put on high alert and I was cognizant of everything from the wind to the beating of my heart. Out of everything in the house, this room seemed to give off the worst vibes, and it was likely due to the fact that across the room, I could see the open door which led outside to the beach. I had just taken a few steps into the room when I heard a soft squelch come from beneath my foot. Freezing, I looked down, but I couldn't see much, even with the moonlight spilling in from the doorway. Weighing my options, I decided to quickly flick on my flashlight for a second to see what I had stepped in. I aimed the light down and holding the beam with my gun hand, I flicked it on. To this very day, I wish to God I never had. 
As I had said, in every other disappearance that I had been called to, aside from the nesting doll knocked over at the girl's house, there had been no signs of violence, no signs of a struggle, nothing. Well, that was not the case here. The first thing I noticed was the broken dishes that littered the floor. Tiny pieces lay scattered all around me, as if somebody had grabbed the china on the dining room table and thrown it at something or someone. The second thing I noticed was that both chairs on this side of the table had been knocked over. One had the ornate wooden carved back broken, showing somebody had been slammed into it with great force. The unknown feeling that I had had at all the prior disappearances was warming its way forward, past all my training and defenses like lava bursting from the surface. The third thing that I saw was the blood. The dining room table had been placed on top of a large braided carpet which covered the wooden floor to keep the cold from seeping up and disrupting those eating at it. And it had been thoroughly soaked in blood. I could see the large stain that I had stepped in and looking left to right, I saw that the table and display case for the china was splattered in blood as well. Instantly, I knew that the girl's father was dead. No person could lose this much blood and survive. The unknown feeling finally burst forth and I finally understood what it was. Dread. I flicked my flashlight off quickly, suddenly feeling extremely vulnerable. This is far beyond any straightforward kidnapping or robbery. This is beyond the scope likely of what these people are used to. And we've been dealing with a serial killer this entire time. And I don't care about the consequences, I'm calling the mainland right. I was snapped out of my thoughts by a noise, one which came from out the open back door. My breath caught on my throat, and I felt my heart begin to thunder in my chest as I gripped my pistol tightly. Slowly I raised my eyes. In the now bright moonlight I could now see that the blood stain turned into a smear, one that signaled something that the girl's father had been dragged. The smear led onto the wooden floor towards the door. Even from here I could see it lead onto the back porch and down the steps onto the beach. The sound came again and I realized it was the creak of the back porch. I raised the gun and pointed it at the doorway. Somebody was out there just out of sight. I saw something move, casting a shadow which stretched across the porch and into my line of sight. For a second I didn't fully process what I was seeing, and then it slammed into me with all the weight of a semi-truck. The shadow had a human-like shape to it, but the proportions were all wrong. Even accounting for warping by the moonlight, the figure seemed too tall. The arms seemed to reach too far down and the shadow of the head looked misshapen. And then it moved. My blood suddenly ran cold as I heard the sound of it breathing. A wheezing rattle of air almost as if it were fighting to suck oxygen into its lungs. The porch creaked more as I saw the shadow grow larger. And then a fresh surge of fear flooded into me as I saw a second shadowy figure appear on the sandy path to the beach. It wasn't directly in the moonlight, but I saw it begin to stagger towards the doorway, and even though it was far away, I got the impression that it had already spotted me. Oh, and there's more than one of them, my mind whispered to me. And then, the one out of sight let out a laugh. I still shiver to this day recalling it. It was wet, gurgling, almost as if it were laughing through a mouth of seawater and it held a malicious glee to it that chilled me to the bone. Nothing human could have let out such a laugh. That was when something snaked around the door from the opposite side. My eyes locked on it, and I felt all the blood drain out of my face. I finally managed to whisper out two words, barely audible. Screw me. Dread and terror like I had never felt before crashed into me like a rogue wave. I only stood there for another second, and then I was running. I turned and bolted from the dining room, sprinting through the study as I heard another inhuman laugh sound from behind me. I didn't even give a second thought to using the gun. I knew that it would be as effective as the china plates had been against them. I raced out the front door and down the steps. I was halfway to my jeep when the light suddenly snapped on, blinding me and freezing me in place. Freeze, drop your weapon. I heard a man's voice order. Hey, don't shoot, I'm a deputy. 
I cried out, the delirium of fear racing through my veins, causing my voice to come out higher and shriller than I had ever heard it before. For another few seconds, nobody spoke, and I feared that I would be open fired upon, but then a familiar voice rang out, lower your weapons, it's my deputy. The lights lowered as well and I finally saw that my backup had already arrived. I was facing what looked like the entire island's police department, plus the sheriff's department as well. I saw the sheriff standing next to the police chief, both holding shotguns. Stony-faced officers stood on all sides of them. I saw that a few of them had already retrieved the girl from my jeep. A blanket had been draped across her shoulders as she sat in the back of a waiting ambulance. I frantically gestured behind me at the house. They're back there. There's at least two of them. I said, my voice still trembling. I saw the chief and the sheriff exchange a dark look with each other. Then they were ordering the officers into the house. They swarmed around me and up the steps as an EMT rushed and guided me back to lean against one of the squad cars. I could hear them calling out to one another as they cleared inside as I was examined. He's okay, Sheriff. He said as he finished and stepped back. Just looks like he's in a bit of shock is all. The sheriff nodded and then gestured for me to follow him. As I did, I noticed something. None of these cruisers have their lights on, and they didn't use their sirens either. Even as focused as I was, I would have heard them approaching. The realization didn't sit right with me. Neither did the look on the sheriff's face. With a low voice, the man asked me what had happened what I had seen when I had entered the house. Fighting the adrenaline and fear still coursing through my system, I did my best to recount everything that had happened since placing the girl in my jeep. When I had gotten to the part about what I had seen in the back door of the dining room, I saw his face darken even further than it already was. They do know what those things are. He stayed quiet for a time after I had finished, and then he sighed as if he had come to a conclusion that he hadn't wanted to and spoke. None of what you just told me is going to be written in your report, deputy. I stared at the man in disbelief before he continued. There's not going to be an incident report of this entire situation, to be more precise. As far as it will be concerned, it never happened. Are you freaking serious, sir? He nodded. Oh, I'm dead serious, deputy. And that is not all. When you return to the station tomorrow, you will find that none of the incident reports that you filed for the past cases, with the sole exception being the Kilcoin case, are there. They have been destroyed and as of now, they never happened. I let out a half gasp, half laugh of shock. He didn't let me speak though, he continued. You're not an islander, Vincent. You came from the mainland. I say this with all due respect, but you're an outsider, and outsiders will never truly understand some things about life here. This, he gestured towards the house that was still filled with officers. This is one of them. I finally found my voice again. Sir, with all due respect to you as well, you're talking about covering up the disappearances, wait no, the deaths of six people. Six people that were butchered and dragged off by God only knows what those things were. And you want me to shut my mouth and let you sweep this under the rug? He locked eyes with me at my words and I saw a look in them that I had never seen before. A hardness that he usually only reserved for criminals. Yes, deputy, I do. At least if you ever want to return to the mainland. I felt my jaw drop open at the man's open, not just imply threat. He spoke again. We have dealt with them for a long time now. Longer than I have been alive. As far as I know, since people moved to the island, and we've always taken care of our own when they return, we keep who we can save. And as for the unfortunate souls, he trailed off. What about those who lost people? I said, feeling a little surge of angry heat overwhelm the terrified side of myself. I gestured towards the girl now being loaded into the ambulance. What about people like her? He spared a look and then turned back to me. We make sure they understand why we don't say anything to people from the mainland. For the exact reason that I'm dealing with now, deputy. 
we take care of our own. I glared at him for another moment and then lowered my eyes. The sheriff's threat had been clear, and I had no doubt that between him, the chief, and the others on the island, if I didn't accept the terms given to me, that I might end up disappearing as well. Finally, I asked one final question. And Kilcoin, how are you going to explain that one? We'll place breadcrumbs make it seem like she might have simply decided to walk out into the water and end it all. Maybe a person followed her from the mainland and abducted her. We'll figure it out, don't you worry. After a time, I finally nodded at not meeting the man's eyes. Fine, I said weakly. Fine, I won't say anything. I felt him place his hand on my shoulder. If you want to leave, I don't blame you one bit. I'll even give you a letter of recommendation for wherever on the mainland you would like to transfer to, as long as you keep your word. I didn't say anything back to him. I simply pulled out of his grasp and walked back to my jeep, getting into it, and I drove away. I left Nantucket the very next day, turning in my letter of resignation to the sheriff's office and calling a moving company on the mainland to come and empty my house. I would end up placing it for sale once I left, happily, and it sold quickly to a nice family to use as their summer home. As I drove my jeep onto the ferry, I remember seeing so many pairs of eyes on me. I saw the sheriff waving me farewell from the dock. I saw some of the residents giving me the side eye. I also felt other eyes on me but those that I couldn't see the owners of. They came from beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic and the feeling of them watching me never abated until the ferry was halfway back to the mainland. That was almost 44 years ago now. I ended up taking a job with the Massachusetts State Police, helped by the letter of recommendation that I did end up receiving from the sheriff. I kept that job for another 20 years before retiring in 2000. The sheriff had told the truth about what would happen in the case of Margaret Kilcoin as well. Even though the case made the mainland news, owing to her brother trying to force new leads, they only found some clothes of her abandoned near a pond, along with her ID and some money, no doubt deliberately placed there to throw these state police and others off. Many ended up believing that she had committed suicide by drowning, and though the case stayed open for a while, interest eventually waned in and went cold. Today, barely anyone ever remembers the case, and many of those that did have died. Nobody ever found out the truth. Because islanders can keep a secret, I only ever went back to Nantucket once on a day trip in 2013. I honestly don't know why I did. Maybe I thought it would be a form of closure that I felt I had never gotten. It didn't help though. The place looked largely unchanged in 33 years, and all the memories came flooding back to me especially when I drove by the house that had haunted my dreams for decades. The swing still hung from the front porch and I shivered in the driver's seat of my sob across the street, the memories seeming as fresh as if they had happened yesterday, especially the memory of that webbed clawed hand snaking around the back door, the dark green almost black scales glinting in the moonlight, the claws digging into the wood like it had been paper mache. I was happy to drive back onto the ferry to return to Cape Cod before the sun went down. I didn't feel the eyes on me like I had had all those years ago, but I knew they were still there, waiting. I'm in my early 70s now. The end of my life is rapidly approaching, especially after I was diagnosed with psoriasis of the liver a year ago, a result of drinking far too much for most of my life in an attempt to try and forget but not even alcohol was ever enough to chase away the memories, the nightmares that woke me in a sheen of sweat, screaming. I finally decided with me staring up at the bladed scythe of the Grim Reaper that I needed to tell the truth about what happened all those years ago. Keeping quiet for over 40 years had burned a hole in my soul, and the threats from the sheriff, likely now long since dead, threw at me ring hollow. And so, after hearing about this website, and more importantly this page, I heard about from my grandnephew, 
where others post accounts of things that they've experienced that are unexplainable and terrifying. I've chosen here to tell. I know full well that most people won't believe me, and that's honestly fine, and maybe it doesn't matter. But the truth is out there now. It's known. My conscience feels lighter being able to share it. And when it's my time, I'll go far more peacefully. But there's another reason that I've chosen to tell you all what happened in 1980. That frigid at January so many miles from the mainland. It's to give you a warning. Because I've kept tabs on the goings on on Nantucket Island. And people still do disappear from there. Fishermen and others have disappeared from the island and the waters around it over the years. And those are the ones who, thanks to the internet and its ability to connect the entire world, weren't able to be swept under the rug. I'm sure there are far more, far more people who disappear from the island than anyone will ever know. They're just still good at covering it up. I can't stop any one of you from going to Nantucket. And in all honesty, I'm not sure that I would want to. It in truth is still one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been to. If you would like to visit during the summer months, go. But if you do, don't let your guard down near the water at all. Because those things, those creatures are still out there. They are smart. Smart enough to clean up after themselves to remove all traces of their presence. The swept sand was proof of that. Stay near others as much as possible. Don't rent remote houses away from everybody else. And most importantly, if you ever hear any noises coming from around your house at night there, don't be like those unfortunate souls. Don't go and open the back door to investigate. Because it'll likely be the last thing you ever do. The holidays are right around the corner and HelloFresh can help take the stress out of dinner by delivering everything you need to cook up tasty meals right to your door, saving you tons of time. Just like always, HelloFresh's ingredients travel from the farm to you, so you know that they're fresh. And everything arrives pre-portioned so you can get right to cooking quickly. With the weather cooling down, my go-to HelloFresh recipe is the one-pot creamy lemon dill chicken soup. It's super easy to make and it helps keep your stomach full and happy. To get started, go to HelloFresh.com slash MrCreepsFree and use code MrCreepsFree for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while the subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash MrCreepsFree with code MrCreepsFree. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit.